Welcome to the Great Connections Podcast. We're your hosts, Marsha Familaro Enright and Liz Parker. In this podcast, we aim to talk about powerful ideas and practices that will aid you to achieving the best in your life and live as a free person, like the ones we use in the Great Connections seminars. Visit thegreatconnections.org for more information on our in-person programs and where you can subscribe and comment on the podcast, where you can find links and resources as well as our email address. We'd love to hear from you. In this episode, we're going to talk more about how each person constructs his or her own mind, whether they know it or not, and especially what it means to think in principle. We'll discuss some examples of how you can develop this habit of thinking and show how empowering having this skill can be. You can radically change your life by examining where your philosophy comes from, but it all starts with learning to think in principle. episode we talked about the art of self-construction or how you can begin to take control of your own mind by understanding and tracing back where your ideas actually come from and in doing so we realized that a lot of our ideas came to us secondhand and without identifying firsthand why we believe the things that we do it can result in a kind of uncertainty about ourselves and we are not very confident in making decisions about our lives and doing things on our own. So it seemed like identifying these ideas firsthand was a really valuable thing to do. Yeah, the trouble is most of us, when we kind of start out in life, we don't realize that fundamental philosophical ideas, what we're holding that we took on sort of consciously, they play a big role in this and that there are ideas all around us. Some of them are good and some of them are destructive but they influence and they counter attempts to improve ourselves, the ideas that we hold. Another aspect uh, to taking control and understanding the world around us is thinking in principle. Well, what do you mean by that? What's different between just thinking about these ideas versus thinking in principle? Well, the thing is, the way the human mind works, it works with concepts and with abstractions, and we have no choice but to make generalizations about things from our concrete experiences. Uh, so... If you know a truth that's of a wide range of things, you have a lot of power and you have a lot of ability to deal with many situations. Thinking in principle is the habit of searching and applying, searching for and applying general principles to understand any aspect of your life. And it's a very powerful habit of mind because true principles apply to broad areas. So your mind is able to discern which principles and domains of knowledge bear on the issues and how they're related to problems that you have and puzzles you have and questions you're trying to think about. This makes me think about when I was studying economics as an undergrad, and I guess a way of learning is thinking, oh, that this is an economic principle I'm learning for school, but then also, how does this apply to me? And I remember this principle of sunk costs, which is like a very simple thing, and like it's used for businesses, but I took it personally, and I was, thinking, well, what does this principle mean? Like, what does it actually mean? And the idea is kind of that it's a cost that's already been incurred, and so you can't really recover it, and so it shouldn't bear into your future decisions. And I guess it's very abstract, but I took this as a principle, and I thought about this in my recent relationship, where, you know, I had invested all this time and energy and development into growing ourselves, and you can use that information and think, oh, well, I invested all this, so I just have to keep continue doing this. But using this principle of sunk cost, it would be thinking more about, well, yes, you you have invested all of that, but it doesn't really bear into what you should decide to do in the future. With that relationship. Yeah. So you, you, you took this idea about sunk cost, and you said, how does it, what does that mean in my own life mm-hmm. if I applied it to my own life? And that was great because that's a, one of the fundamental habits of thinking in principle is always asking, how does a particular idea affect me in my own life? So, you know, thinking in principle, it has a lot of applications to your lives, right? Now, a principle is a a general truth or a fundamental truth on which other truths depend. 
And if you're able to think down to the root of any question or problem, you're doing it by thinking in principle. So what you want to have is this habit of mind to search for and identify which general truths best apply to whatever you're thinking about. And also, it's important to ask yourself things like, do I know what my words mean when I'm thinking about this problem? Um, what subjects apply to this problem? Have I thought of all the subjects that are, are applicable? And like what you did, if I used this idea in my life, what would that mean? We can give an example of how to do this if we think about the phrase we talked about in the last episode, education is good, that people take that for granted, that education is good. And they don't always think about, well, what does that mean? What's the implication of it? But if you think in principle, you ask things to yourself like, well, what is education? What is the good? What is my standard of the good? And what is the standard of the good? How are these things related to, to, to human life? And why do I care about the good? And in what circumstances? What would make getting an education bad? Have I thought of all the relevant facts and all the ideas to answer that question? And if I haven't, where should I look to check up on these, you know, where I can come up with these? So if you ask these kinds of questions about any particular premise that you have or conclusion or idea uh, or problem, then you're using the principles of uh, a very well-ordered mind, so you, one in which you have clear ideas of what the fundamentals are and what the relationship of the ideas are to each other. You know, when you are describing these questions about, well, what is education? Is it good? I guess kind of back to that earlier example of sunk costs, what these questions do, I think, is give that clarity to help you make decisions. Because otherwise, you're just wondering like, oh, well, I have these feelings. I don't really know what to do. I don't really know how to evaluate them. And so I feel like also with education, I kind of did the same thing that most people do is high school, college, and I get a job, but I never questioned what is education? Like, why do I value it? And like, are there instances where it's bad to get an education in terms of missed opportunities or how much money I'm paying for it? So when you're talking about thinking in principle, I think why it hits home for me is because it gives you the clarity to make decisions. Whereas maybe just thinking about them is like you get all this input and all these opinions about, well, education is great. Everybody deserves an education. Or, you know, if you invest your time with somebody, you really have to commit and just go for it all the way. And so you don't really know how to evaluate all this information, but you have it. So thinking in principle kind of takes you to the root or the origin on which everything else is built off of. And, and that's because um, there's a hierarchy to all your concepts. So it, meaning some concepts are more important, other ones are dependent on them. An example of that is if, you know, it's a very common phrase or belief that everything is an illusion. And people don't realize what kind of impact that actually can have on them. So it's a good example of something to examine to see, well, if you, if you literally believe that everything's an illusion, what's the consequence of that? Well, I would say you find yourself in a position where you feel strongly that something is right or wrong, like censorship or violence against certain groups of people, but you have this underlying principle you're operating off that there's no hard truth or reality about anything. There's no right or wrong because, well, everything's an illusion. So you have to accept all actions as perfectly valid. And also, if, if everything's an illusion then everything and everything is just a matter of opinion, then everyone's judgments are valid. And so that means that anybody who believes in censorship and violence is just as right about what they're thinking as anybody who believes in tolerance towards other people. So you can see the actual really dire consequences of believing something as some people might even say it flippantly, oh, everything's an illusion, right? But they don't realize how it can work in your mind. Even when you don't know it, if you hold that even to some extent seriously, it, it ends up working. Your, your mind is like a, your subconscious is like a logic crunching machine. And it starts saying to, it starts working with that principle and saying, okay, what does that imply? And then what does that mean when, I, when I'm thinking about X, Y, or Z? It all has to do with this idea that there's this hierarchy of concepts. Yeah, I feel like I have been <laughs> in that mindset before where 
like I think like oh well we can't really know anything it's all a matter of perspective but then you do encounter those situations where this really doesn't feel right and that seems really wrong but then you don't know how to make sense of that so when I hear you talking about thinking in principle and this hierarchy of thought I hear you saying like we have to explicitly seek out what those things are that are guiding our thinking but it feels like a really difficult thing to do because it's like a self-examination where you're trying to untangle this thread of thought and it's hard to know that this sense of confusion stems from this thought all the way down there of that everything's an illusion. So mm -hmm. how do you even trace it back to that? Mm -hmm. Well, and also you have the problem that if you're not thinking that clearly, how does the very organ that doesn't think that clearly get itself to think more clearly. Exactly. So this, this is why being more conscious about the whole situation um, and, and what you can do is you can use your power of self-awareness, of, of, of paying attention to what's in your mind, um, what ideas you have, and stopping yourself when you have time to question them. And you can use that power to help untangle your thinking. But there's quite a few habits that you can develop that really help with this. Uh, for example, one of the first great habits is to always ask yourself, well, what evidence for a particular theory or conclusion or idea, what evidence is most relevant to that? And a great example of that is what's called Fermi's paradox. Now, Fermi, people know, mostly know Fermi for his creation of the atomic bomb, the first controlled chain reaction. But he was a very brilliant physicist and he was he had a famous ability to hone problems down to their essentials what you know what i would call thinking in principle so fermi's paradox was this people said well given the mind boggling size of the universe there's probably a great number of inhabitable planets and if there's so many there's there's very likely to be intelligence on other planets intelligent life forms and people said oh yeah there 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 must be intelligent life forms for that and he said what he did was he cut through all the arguments about it and all these calculations, people made many calculations of probability given the number of planets. And he said, cut through that and he said, well, if there's so many of them, why haven't we run into them yet? And that kind of honed the problem down to the basics. When you think, okay, you're calculating all these probabilities, but he said, okay, if the probability is so high, why haven't we seen any intelligent, other intelligent life forms yet? So he's, that's an example of thinking about what is the most relevant evidence. And in his case, he's saying, we haven't seen any yet, given all the probabilities, right? Uh, another example, another habit, excuse me, that's very good to use is to ask yourself, what general principles or laws applies to this kind of thing? And how would it affect this situation? For example, you see something happen. And if all you know is one way of explaining or responding to it, you might arrive at a solution for that particular situation, but only that one alone. But if you have a general principle, then you can apply it to many situations. And an example of that was in 2005, I was researching college costs and tuition. And I saw that uh, you know tuition had really skyrocketed in the last 30 years. And I asked myself, well, why has it gone up so much? Um, and how can we help students deal with that? Well, I guess my first reaction to hearing something like that is like, well, if tuition is going up and students are having a hard time paying for it, then we just need more money to fund students to go. And I think maybe sometimes throwing money at us at a problem sometimes works, but it seems like maybe that's not necessarily always the case. Yeah, well, that, that idea of just let's throw money, more, more money at it has certainly been used a lot in public school arguments. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, we just have to more, have more money for the schools and and uh, the schooling will get better, and that sure hasn't been the case. Yeah, and in this case, of course, in 2005, I think there were a lot of people who were thinking your idea that, oh, well, we just need to have more money to help students go to college. But I, I think there's more to it, and um, when I was thinking about in 2005, I said, well, we're, what uh, ideas or principles might be applicable. And so the first thing I did was look at, well, how much should the cost have gone up just by inflation alone? And when, when I went to Northwestern University in the 70s, it had a very expensive tuition of $3,000 a year. 
Okay. That's how much I paid for books for one semester. <laughs> right, right, right. So I, I looked at it, I used, I put it into an inflation calculator, and um, I found out that, well, $3,000 a year in 1973 should have been $16,000 now. And you know what Northwestern's tuition is now? How much? 50000 Okay. Now, even if... Northwestern, I mean, Northwestern is higher rated now than it was in the 70s, but even if it was higher rated really that much, I mean, that's that's more than triple, yeah. right? And um, so it's pretty unlikely that it, it would be because it was just higher rated. And I asked myself, well, what's another possibility? Well, is it because there's an increased population going to college and so they're placing more demand on uh, this the places at Northwestern, and I said, yeah, that's probably the case because there there is a huge increase in the number of people going to college. But then I thought to myself, well, but how is that enabled? Why is there all of a sudden this big increase in population? Is it just that the, the population in the United States has gotten so much bigger since the 70s? And well, it, that doesn't seem to be the case either. I mean, it has gone, gotten bigger, but not that much bigger. So I thought to myself, well, is there some way that enabled more people to go to college? And sure enough, what it comes down to is that the government um, started offering loans that were practically free money, or at least they, they were experienced by college students as free money because you didn't have to pay for them while you were in college, and they were a very low interest rate, and it took a long time to pay them back. So that fooled young people into not worrying about taking on these loans, and it almost made it feel free. And uh, this is one of the things I think Nowadays, actually, there's um, quite a few organizations that have been research researching this issue, and sure enough, that's the same answer that they came up with. Uh, there's a organization on college affordability. But what happened when I was thinking about it is I realized it was very similar to what had happened with health care costs, which had started to go up and up and up quite a few years ago because of Medicare and Medicaid. Because with Medicare and Medicaid, there's also no breaks on prices because individuals weren't having to be concerned about their own costs. They were having somebody else pay for it. Well, it sounds like there are a couple principles in that alone. Well, first of all, that education is good, so we have to fund it. And then also, the only way to solve this problem is, well, we need to enable students to go. So we need to give them the more money. So there are these two principles that kind of led us into this mm -hmm. mess. But if you're not trying to get to the principles that are really guiding it, then you think like, oh, we just need more money. We just need more money. And it doesn't really create a real solution to the problem. Mm -hmm. It just keeps ratcheting it up. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's interesting because it's when we have these theories about what we should be doing, but they don't really match up with our experience of what's happening in reality. So it seems there's some kind of conflict. And I hear you saying that if we're to really evaluate whether something, a principle is reliable or whether it's useful in guiding our thinking, thinking is to see how does it match up with what's happening and um, that's the kind of evidence we can look for. Mm -hmm. So when we're, when we're thinking about a theory about why X, Y, or Z has happened, we want to make sure that it's based on reliable evidence and whether the evidence it's really supports the theory, mm -hmm. right? I, I have another example of something along these lines and that's I have a very smart young friend uh, who uses evolutionary psychology to try to understand why men and women act the way they do in personal relationships. Uh, for example, the principle that women seek to marry up, um, which now has a fancy name in evolutionary psychology called hypergamy. And it's true that many women seek men who are wealthier or of higher status from achievements or family background I mean, that's, that does happen quite a bit, right? And the theory is, the evolutionary psychology theory is that posits that uh, women do this for security because of their vulnerability during pregnancy and with children and to ensure that the children are taken care of, you know, that there's enough uh, wealth or position to take care of them. And I would say on the other side too, of course, men also marry up. And the way they do it is they seek women of greater desirability and beauty, sometimes in their own handsomeness, might warrant, you know. So that's their way of, of, of marrying up.
But anyway, uh, all these evolutionary psychology theories, they can be used like a hammer and applied as if everything is a nail. Okay, we're going to explain every human action by evolutionary psychology. And the trouble is that when you do that, uh, you miss many individual motives in the way people act. So I think you have to ask yourself, well, if hypergamy is true, in other words, women tend to marry up, and it's motivated by this evolutionary drive to protect children or to protect yourself during pregnancy, how does it work in the individual woman's mind? How does that evolutionary drive actually operate in the individual mind? How does it motivate that woman? You know, does a woman have to have pregnancy in mind when she's interested in a wealthy man? I mean, I would say no, because I think plenty of women, when they're interested in a wealthy man, are just thinking about the great clothes they're going to get if they marry this man, right? Or the jewelry. Or in her mind, she might be anxious about what her friends think and she wants to impress them. So that's how she's thinking about why she wants to go after this wealthy or high achieving man. And also there's the problem, well, what about the woman that goes against type? I mean, who marries a, a man that's poor? Why does she do that if evolutionary psychology motives are so strong, right? Or what about women who decide not to have children? Mm -hmm. exactly. Like, how can they even make that decision if everything is controlled by your biological evolutionary drives? It mm -hmm. doesn't fit. And I think also when I, I think there are a lot of things that are appealing about this principle of evolutionary psychology because it does seem to explain some things and it gives some valuable insights. But at the same time, I think this is kind of what you were talking about earlier about, well, you have to have a certain self-awareness. Because when I hear some things, I'm like, that doesn't fit with my experience. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not attracted to this person because I think that they're going to give me great babies and take care of them and give me a cushy life. You know, that seems actually very low on the priority list. It's, you know, that doesn't count for like, well, do we share the same values and do we have a connection? And that's not physical and that's not, it seems like not purely biological, yeah, is that person interesting? Can I talk to them yeah. and feel understood or have subjects that we can share in common? And then like having that principle or operating off that principle, it makes you question, well, are my friendships just like driven by seeking higher social status? And well, that doesn't seem to match up with my experience either. Well, I was thinking, I was thinking that one thing about evolutionary psychology theories is that in many cases they explain some of the conditions that are necessary for people to have any kind of motive, but it's not a sufficient explanation. So that's another principle to always think about when you're thinking about a particular theory, is is this theory come up with a reason that is sufficient to explain everything, or is it just a, a reason that's necessary to explain something? And you were saying, I remember you were saying earlier that you thought that when you're thinking about thinking in principle, you can see how there it's like it has a ripple effect. Yeah, um, we had talked about how well, thinking of principle is kind of like the principle is like the initial drop of water in a body of water, and this creates these ripples. And at first, they're clearly defined distinct ripples, but as they get further away from the center, their waves get a little bit larger, they're harder to clearly grasp. And when you were talking about thinking in principle, it made me feel like it gives you a way to navigate through those ambiguous ripples to see where tracing it back to that original source. So it's kind of like an anchor for your thought to go back to. Yeah, and, and applying that, for example, to going back to the evolutionary psychology example, you know, it's not that evolution doesn't have an influence on people, but these purported drives aren't necessarily the only or even the main causes of people's behavior, you know. Um, and I say purported because, after all, there are theories of human behavior, and I'd like to know, and human nature, and I'd like to know how they're going to be tested. So you can get lost in the weeds of these ideas, you know, and, and, and not notice the uniquely individual reasons why somebody is acting the way they are. Whereas when you're thinking in principle, you're constantly asking yourself, well, what general ideas apply to this situation besides this particular theory? and see what you get for the best results. So another habit to keep in mind is trying to make sure you think of all the general ideas from all the different domains of knowledge that might apply. What's all the evidence? 
and then turn that over in your mind to see which best fits all your facts. Another habit that's kind of related to this is to see the connections, to be looking for the connections between different groups of facts and experiences because you're seeking to apply your ideas widely. And, and if you think about it, this is how creative people think. They're very good at recognizing the relationships between very disparate domains of knowledge. And a famous example of that is with Gutenberg and the invention of the printing press. I don't know if our listeners know this story. People had been printing with block letters, you know, each letter on a different block by hand for some time. Um, and one day he was watching people making wine by pressing grapes with what was called a wine press. And it suddenly came to him that he could put the blocks of the letters on the press and have it all in words and print large quantities at the same time. So that's how he came up with the idea of the printing press. And that's a good example of where you've got something from really disparate domains of knowledge coming together in the creative person's mind. So this is where asking yourself, have I applied all of the ideas from all the different areas I can think about to this problem or this question that I have. When you describe it that way, it sounds kind of like you're kind of being a scientist or you're investigating. So you're like a little bit skeptical and questioning about things, but that can really lead to like new discovery, whether that's in yourself or kind of like this creativity thing where you're making connections between things. So I guess so far what I hear thinking in principle can mean a few different things where it's like getting to the root of an idea. So you're like clearly defining things or getting to the bottom of things and then weighing evidence from re relevant material to see, is there support for this or does this really match up with my experience? And then looking for the relationships, like you said, the creativity, what unites these things and what makes them different? So how can I really apply this? Yeah, I think that's a very good summary, Liz. Thanks for coming up with that. I, was, I wanted to mention one final habit today that I think is very important, and that's how to put principles into action or how to see them in action. And what I mean by that is whenever you accept an abstract principle, you want to ask yourself, if I truly lived by this, what would that mean for my life? Uh, kind of like what you did with, uh, with the sunk cost principle, right? So it's important to think when you're applying this, to always ask yourself, how any idea relates to the real world and especially to your own life and what would happen if you put it in practice. And uh, I think a good example of this is the widely held idea that the highest ethical principle is to sacrifice your interests to help other people. Like that's the, you are being the most ethical, the best person possible if you will sacrifice your interests in order to help others. And, or another way to put it is the best, most virtuous way to live is to live for other people. So what does that mean? How would you implement that? If you consistently did that, what would it mean? Yeah, I often hear this idea, and I think I believed it for a long time too, that to be the best kind of person, to be like a morally good person, you always have to be in service of others. And like you are always last. And I don't know exactly where this came from. You know, I'm like, from a Korean American family, so it could be from that, or it's just from the larger culture, or what we learn in school. But if you've thought about this, if you really take that seriously, if you give up all your time and resources to taking care of other people, like your family or, or your society, if you just donate and volunteer all your time and your money and resources to doing this, like, what would that look like? Well, it looks like you'd have nothing left. So this self-deprivation doesn't really make sense because first of all you're incapable of helping people when you don't have anything but I think and it also assumes that there's no mutual mutually beneficial way where you can benefit yourself and benefit others at the same time that is not self-sacrificial but it I think it's kind of like when you were talking about that everything is an illusion idea like if you live with that you know you kind of put yourself in a situation where you have to accept all these kind of horrible things that you think are wrong but if you take that principle as valid, then you can't say anything. And if you think that to be virtuous, you have to always live for other people, that's not really something you can live up to. So you're constantly feeling guilty and inadequate. And it totally undermines the idea of any kind of system of ethics that you can actually live by. And 
yeah, it kind of takes the idea that humans are never perfect. We can never live up to that idea. It's just kind of a really sad outlook. And if you apply this to personal relationships, like if it's really about other people, then you shouldn't love someone for what they're capable of or if they're, you know, successful. You should really just love people for if they need something and you can provide it. You know, that's such a disgusting way to picture love. Like you don't want to, like, we don't expect people to love that way, but we expect them to live that way in terms of their resources. And then we judge them on that. And we judge ourselves on how we live up to this unlivable standard. So true. I mean, think about what does it mean? Uh, would you really want to be loved because you need something and the, and you need to get it from the other person? Like you need help or you're weak or something like that. And that's why the other person loves you. Uh, that's not a real attractive reason yeah. to be loved, you know? And, you know, on the other, and the other point that you were making about, could you really live by that or not? It, it, just from a food point of view, if you were really sacrificing your interest to other people all the time, that would mean you would always give your food away. Mm -hmm. So then how could you live, you know? And, and that's if you take the principle seriously and consistently. But you can't because you can't live by it. So then you get into these problems of feeling guilty, like you mentioned, right? Well, yeah, an example. Also, when you've talked about the food example, if you give everything away, then you have nothing left. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about like people who also have these relationships with their family where they're responsible for taking care of their family and putting in their resources. And how, in the end, kind of because I feel like I've had this personal experience too where... Well, I'm just, you know, making this money, I'm giving it to my family, and I'm doing this, and you basically don't have anything left for yourself or for them. So it's really a destructive way to think. Yes, and and it's not that we're saying that that you should live in a way where you don't want to help other people, or you, you don't want to be have a rich relationship with somebody where if they do need, some, if, if they're a friend of yours and they do need something, or, or you, you don't want to... Um, try to change things so that poor children in Africa have a better life. We're not saying that at all, mm -hmm. but that, that you can do that without totally sacrificing your own interests. Mm -hmm. So, but that the, that the highest moral virtue is to sacrifice your own interests for other people is really destructive because of it. And it twists the motivation a yeah. little bit yes. and turns something that could be a really beautiful thing into something where yes. you resent and makes you feel inadequate. Right, right. Instead of instead of um, you getting enjoyment and uh, feeling efficacious and powerful by helping somebody else, you're feeling guilty, and the other person is uh, when when the other person is helped, instead of looking at them as somebody who's capable, you're looking at them as a as a victim. Mm -hmm. You know what kind of psychological attitude is that? So there's many many ramifications of that idea. Very very many negative ramifications that people don't usually even realize and that are all tangled up in this with in their mind with the idea of the positives of helping other people but anyway it's it's a it's a great example of why it's important to have a very well ordered and well functioning mind i like to summarize the way in which you should use your mind like this that the hallmark of a well functioning mind is the ability to identify facts, analyze ideas, and integrate knowledge, and successfully translate principles into action. I think if you can do all that, that you have a very well-ordered mind, and you're able to function in your life a lot better than when we're just going along in this haphazard way. So my question to the audience is, what implicit principles do you have that are determining and directing your life? but maybe you don't know about it. What ethical principles do you hold that you don't know about? Liz and I put together a document uh, with examples of the principles we talked about today, the thinking principles, and a series of questions you can use to help analyze your own ideas and to develop the skills and habits you need to have a well-ordered mind. So we'll, we're going to have that on our website for you. And we'd love to hear from you about what your experiences are with this thinking in principle exercise. Like, where do you see it changing how you think about certain issues and things? It's definitely, I think, a skill that you have to practice. Like, I feel like I'm continually trying to understand why do I believe these things? Why am I feeling these things? And it's like any kind of skill, mindfulness meditation or fitness. It's something 
that you have to continually do to have the skill and to have it have impact over time you really have to continue to exercise it and you just don't ever stop doing it but then it becomes easier over time and it almost comes naturally after mm -hmm. that exactly well speaking of skills I think it's time for me to practice my cooking skills and go make some lunch um, we'll pick up next time with uh, a talk about why is there violence on the campuses these days and we'll see if we can apply some of these principles of thinking in principle to that issue for you uh, if you like this podcast, you can support us by leaving a review on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or even Yelp. And you can tell your friends about it. You can mention it on Facebook or other social media. And you can support it by contributions at our website, thegreatconnections.org. Thanks for listening, and please join us next time.